class divided. We're dividing after trivia. Um, <laughs> I did not prepare a trivia game, but we could. We'll uh, we'll see what we can win here. I don't think anything we learned this class is trivia. It's all very important. Very good. Two gold stars for papers. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's a gold star, it doesn't mean. <laughs> What about silver stars? No. Okay, so last week we kind of talked about the, the build-up stages, uh, the build-up stage, rather, of the war. So, uh, remember I kind of talked about in the 1950s, 1954, the French were kind of expelled from uh, Vietnam. Uh, President Eisenhower at the time had been kind of supporting the French economically and militarily, uh, and kind of slowly over the years, our advisor presence built up until 1964, when what led to a more widespread U.S. commitment. What event? Trivia. China fell to communism. No. That was Cuba. Cuba. We talked about it last week. Event in a. Famous body of water. Oh, yeah. Tonkin Offensive? Yeah, some of our ships. Okay. Attacked a couple of our ships. So, I wish I could give it to one team, but you were both kind of, <laughs> kind of spouting it off at the same time. So, no points awarded this round. Uh, but the Gulf Tonkin uh, incident led to Congress passing what resolution? Very good. Uh, which basically did what? What did that enable the president to do? Declare war and stop their aggression. Okay. Yeah, in essence, waging war. So, a formal declaration of war can only come from Congress. So, that's spelled out in the, in the Constitution. Uh, but that kind of gave the president, uh, for you French speakers in here, a carte blanche. So, white card. What? White card. Okay, so clean slate, whatever he wants to do. Uh, to uh, to win that war. All right, so kind of 1964-1965, large uh, army marine units start uh, showing up uh, in Vietnam. Uh, last week we talked several of the hardships. You know, talking guerrilla warfare, restrictions put <coughs> on us uh, as far as rules of engagement went, uh, kind of from Washington D.C. Uh, as well as some limits to our technology. Remember we talked about the F-4 Phantom in air-to-air -air combat. Uh, based on our rules of engagement, you had to be close enough to visually see that it was a MiG, but then that was too close for missiles. We didn't have guns. Uh, but up there you can kind of see the uh, 1969, that was about the, the peak of U.S. Uh, presence in Vietnam. Um, big thing, you know, over half a million troops on the ground in Vietnam but roughly a half million supporting from, uh, from other bases as well. So I think we kind of started talking about the Paris Peace Talks. Um, basically, 1968, we kind of started scaling back our bombing, um, kind of to show good faith that we were trying to take steps towards peace uh, with Vietnam. But the, uh, the talks went nowhere fast. Um, and 1968 also happened to be an election year. Who was elected president in 68? Nixon. Okay, very good. I am not a crook. Uh, that's my best Nixon impression I've done all year. So, um, he was elected in 68. He kind of started a policy of what we call Vietnamization, uh, handing the war back to the South Vietnamese military. Um, I tried to use, uh, tried to coin a term. Uh, in the 200 class, the NSMS, we're going to talk about Iraq and Afghanistan. I tried to call uh, uh, the Iraqification process. Um, I don't know that the uh, historians ever picked up on it, though, so I'll work on it. I'll write a book soon. Um, but basically, kind of behind, uh, behind closed doors, um, U.S. Uh, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, he was meeting with a North Vietnamese negotiator, a man by the name of Le Duc 
Co. So it's pronounced T actually. So, um, but basically, kind of behind the scenes negotiations going on. Um, in essence, though, North Vietnam just kind of kept stalling. They come to the peace talks, uh, say, "Yeah, we could we can work on the uh, these negotiations." Uh, then they may come back a couple weeks, a couple months later, um, and nothing has changed. Uh, <clears throat> all along the way, we're kind of withdrawing U.S. troops uh, between 1968-1972. Um, you see the numbers up there. By 1972, we only had about 200,000. Wait, excuse me, is that yep. left on the ground or is that left? In in country. In in Vietnam. Okay. So military presence. I just think the wording would like say left the country. Okay. Sorry. There it was actually both. Sorry. Um basically we had two hundred thousand left. I'm sorry, that was uh poor wording. I'll get that corrected. So um before I post these. So we had about 200,000 uh, left in country. Um, kind of further complicating these peace talks, and mind you, these are kind of going on on and off for about four years. Uh, and in March 1972, North Vietnam launched a large conventional offensive. So by conventional, we mean tanks, trucks, infantry, uniformed soldiers from the north invading the south uh, of about 120,000 troops. Kind of at this point in time, we had less American troops on the ground. We were kind of more in that supporting role, uh, in that Vietnamization role, and in the war back over to the South Vietnamese. Uh, South Vietnamese military held up fairly well. However, American air power needed to step in to help uh, stop the North Vietnamese offensive. So that's where we launched, and we're going to talk about it more uh, either later today or next week, uh, Operation uh, Linebacker, Linebacker 1. Um, so basically, uh, it was a large interdiction campaign. So from first semester, what's interdiction? Pulling up like train tracks, supply lines, factories, digging into farm fields. Okay. Uh, primarily, yeah, supply lines. So uh, preventing either troops or war material from reaching the front line. So that's basically what we were doing. We were trying to stop them in their tracks. Yes. Oh, would that also be uh, attacking their supply depots? Or um, more, more kind of, um, North Vietnam didn't have a whole lot of, like, their own supply production. Um, uh, they were, again, they were getting mostly from the Chinese and the Russians. Um, so again, it was, in this case, it was kind of more just attacking, um, uh, convoys, uh, you know, even tanks from reaching the front, uh, front lines. Uh, and actually, some units that had previously pulled out, uh, American air units that had previously kind of pulled out of the, uh, of the war had gone back to the, you know their home bases in the United States. Many of them are actually brought back um, at this time to uh, to the South Pacific to uh, help out with uh, Linebacker One. And ultimately, uh, Linebacker One was a success. Uh, the North suffered about 50,000 dead out of 120,000 that attacked, um, and uh, at least as many others were wounded during this unsuccessful invasion. So. Basically, a majority were killed or wounded uh, from that invasion. But we're going to watch a little bit of uh, air power in action with a video. Oh, come on now. Oh, there we go. So, a uh, big thing in this video I want you to pay attention to, uh, kind of a uh, kind of part of the samples of behavior actually. So, it's good stuff. Um, just kind of some of the different air missions that we uh, that we flew. So, you know, pay attention. There's going to be a, a couple minutes where they're talking about search and rescue missions, uh, some of the bombing missions, uh, the reconnaissance missions, um, just kind of all the different uh, missions that we flew. We'll be talking about those for the majority of the rest of the class today. U.S. President Nixon decided to attack Italy so vigorously that it would prefer to negotiate rather than continue with endless guerrilla warfare. The attack was to be called Linebacker 2. The artificial rules of engagement were lifted. 
Linebacker 2 started with a B-52 attack on Hanoi and Haiphu. The enemy defenses were heavy, but the Strategic Air Command, with 729 sorties of 11 days, dropping 15,000 tons of bombs, losing only 15 aircraft. By the 11th day, North Vietnamese opposition had been hammered into the ground. There were no more SAMs to be fired, no sites to fire them from. North Vietnamese returned to the negotiating table, forced there by linebacker two. Among the unsung heroes of the war were the crews of the Boeing KC 135 tankers that refueled the attack aircraft in flight. The KC 135s were, in effect, a force multiplier. They doubled and redoubled the value of the fighters and the B 52s. The extreme danger of aerial refueling is all the more. The tanker is 300,000 pounds of fuel and metal moving. 500 miles per hour. It must make a rendezvous and then the gentlest of collisions with an equally swift mass doubling through. The night operations and the turbulent thunderstorms of Vietnam, the radio silence, and the minimum lights added to the hazard. Tankers allowed fighters to take off with heavy armament loads, topping them up with fuel once they were airborne. Then the tankers would orbit, waiting to refuel the fighters on their way back from the mission. In the course of the war, the KC 135s made more than 800,000 refuels, offloading almost 9 billion pounds of fuel. The rewards for this hard, hazardous, unrelenting work were mainly psychological. A fighter pilot might say, Thanks, you can count that as a save, as he broke away. But for the tanker, he would have had to abandon his aircraft. In Vietnam, visual reconnaissance assumed the importance it had gained in World War I. The intimate nature of war in Vietnam brothers fighting against brothers in their own villages, made visual reconnaissance absolutely critical. But the USAF could not select its own target from reconnaissance focus. That was the responsibility of the Military Assistance Command, Vietnam. The MACB also determined the time, location, and manner of reconnaissance mission. Despite these command difficulties, Reconnaissance crews continued to plunge unarmed into hotly defended zones to bring back essential programs. The most intimate of all forms of reconnaissance in the war was the forward air control. The fact had to ensure that a target was in fact the enemy and that friendly personnel and installations were not damaged. The only way to do this was to fly low and slow in the combat area, vulnerable to everything from a thrown rock to anti-aircraft fire. For much of the war, the fact flew unarmed light aircraft, like Cessna 01s. Okay, this is fine. Okay, uh, 6 one this is your bomb. Just short. He had to find the target, call for fighter bombers, mark the targets, and control the attack. All this, and the ability to assess damage, call for extreme skill and courage. Later in the war, fast forward air controllers, jet F-100s and F-4s, conducted fast reconnaissance in high threat areas. Only the most experienced veterans, in first class physical condition, withstand the four to five hours of low-level flight in high-G terms commanded by this mission. It was service at the sharp end of the stick, as valuable for saving innocent lives as for hitting the target. Strategic air raid was more important in Vietnam than it was in either World War II or Korea. 
neither the harbors nor the roads of Vietnam permitted timely unloading of ships. Thirty-four squadrons of the military air command were dedicated to air. Initially, most of the aircraft used were obsolete Douglas C-124s. The first major duty to cargo capability was a Lockheed C-141 from 1965. It could carry twice the C-124's cargo, twice as fast and twice as far. In 1969, controversial Lockheed C-5A became operational. Ultimately, 73 of these giants saw service. Tactical airlift in Vietnam came into its own with the arrival of the Lockheed C-130 Hercules, an immensely strong four-engine turboprop. The transports operated routinely in combat zone. Some analysts have written that tactical airlift was more important in Vietnam than the interdiction provided by tactical fighters. Transports carried men and cargo to the scene of battle. They were used in major parachute assaults. It was backbreaking, knuckle biting work, and it went on routine day after day. From 1967 to 1973, Tactical airlift carried more than 7 million tons of passengers and cargo within South Vietnam, almost 10 times the total carried during the Korean War. One of the most potent weapons of the Vietnam War, the side-firing gunship, was derived from transport aircraft. Equipped with cannon and gun ports, the aerial gunship was a joint product of inspiration and desperation. The theory was that the pilot would make pylon turns, sighting his wingtip on a point on the ground and circling around it. Guns inside of the aircraft could be sighted accurately on a relatively stationary target. There were plenty of C-47s around to be converted as gunships. The AC-47 gunships came to be called Spooky, or Dragon Ship, or Puff, inspired by the song Puff the Magic Dragon, referring to the outpouring of flame and smoke when the guns were fired. Demand for gunships increased, and faster, more modern aircraft were selected for conversion. Among them was the Lockheed AC-130. Gunships were extremely cost-effective in terms of the numbers of trucks destroyed and the number of lives saved in defending buildings and ports. It was lonely, dangerous work, but rewards for saving forces on the ground and destroying enemy supplies were immediate and apparent. Of all the missions in Vietnam, the one that best captures the spirit of good intent is that of the search and rescue teams. They risk their lives day in and day out for their motto, so that others may live. By 1968, every air crew member flying in Southeast Asia knew that if you went down, every effort would be made to rescue, regardless of location, cost, or impact on other missions. It was not until November 1964, after more than 20 aircraft had crashed or been shot down, the first official trained search and rescue capability became available. Eventually, standard rescue teams used Douglas A1E Sky Raiders, known in Vietnam as Sandys, as armed escorts. The job of the Sandys was to put down suppressing fire to keep the enemy away from the downed air crew while the helicopters went in to make the rescue. In 1965, the Sikorsky HH-3E helicopter, the Jolly Green Giant, was introduced. The rescue helicopters endured everything from attacks by MiGs to running the gauntlet of anti-aircraft fire.
search and rescue operation of the water. Air Force and Marine helicopters flew mission after mission to ferry out South Vietnamese patriots who dare not face the communist occupiers. The United States Air Force entered the war in Southeast Asia when it was ordered to do so. It withdrew in the same way. Ten eight years of the World War would not have been in our history. We would have had our history of the conditional times and places, but in terms of the general history of the nation and the general history, I can say we came out of the enormous amount of teaching and embedding, almost burned down our souls, set of lessons about our inadequacies, that is, about the deficiencies of our ability to do what we thought that our working people would do, but we certainly knew that our should be. The politicized command structure that had been such a disaster would change. A new group of leaders would emerge, well grounded in the advanced technologies and tactics of the time. As a result of the tough and often bitter experience of Vietnam, they would be better equipped to face the battles of the future. Okay. Yeah, I, do you know why they said that the C5 was controversial? Uh, it was kind of one of the uh, one of those things that was just really, really, really expensive at the time, <coughs> um, and it was, uh, and even to this day, it's still. Not attribution, academic environment. It's just not a very good aircraft. I mean, yeah, it can move tanks, it can move, I mean, you can take a helicopter apart and put it in there, uh, but they just break it all the time. Um, it's kind of one of those aircraft that it's just a lot of landing gear issues, hydraulic issues, just because uh, it's so big and it's just hard to work on and repair to. So the old joke is like C5 crews get to like take the best trips out there because they'll go somewhere like Hawaii. Uh, but yeah, it was a very expensive kind of project too, where we had, um, <laughs> even at the time we had, uh, I mean, we kind of had some of the more legacy propeller uh, driven cargo aircraft like the C-130, uh, they mentioned in the video, um, but we had a really good, um, it was the predecessor of the C-17, it was called the C-141, uh, basically, you know, DC-141 uh, civilian uh, aircraft that was used for uh, So, um, you know, in the aftermath of the uh, the Easter Offensive, Linebacker 1 uh, kind of kept going on. Uh, a little bit more aggressive bombing campaign uh, against North Vietnam. Um, but it was still evident to uh, President Nixon that North Vietnam was not being sincere in their efforts towards peace. So, in late 1973, he ordered Operation Linebacker 2. Uh, which the sole purpose of Linebacker 2 was to uh, basically end the war, to get uh, North Vietnam to negotiate in full earnest. Um, <coughs> and that basically took place December uh, 1970, uh, uh, sorry, December 1972, late 73. Uh, and in January 1973, uh, we reached a peace, um, basically where all uh, combat units from South Vietnam would be withdrawn. Uh, and basically by the end of March, uh, that happened. Um, and basically, as part of the peace uh, peace accords, uh, Cambodia, Laos, and North and South Vietnam, uh, each country would re remain uh, in its own independent country. Uh, in the North and South Vietnam, uh, boundary mark was set at the 17th parallel which is basically where it had started um, prior to U.S. entry into the war. Uh, both sides agreed to release all prisoners of war, uh, which was kind of one of the big uh, big issues at the time. We wanted to make sure all of our uh, POWs uh, came home. Yes? I think, did you say Nixon thought that the South Vietnam wasn't sincere enough in that piece? Uh, that North Vietnam was. 
So basically by mid-1973, the United States was out of the war uh, in Southeast Asia. We were out of the war. We still had um, minor numbers of troops basically on the ground uh, in Saigon <laughs> primarily, um, the South Vietnamese capital, uh, basically protecting the U.S. embassy. So we'll talk about that here. So as you all know, there are not uh, uh, there are not two Vietnams today. There's only one Vietnam. So sorry if I uh, burst anybody's bubble with that information. Uh, but basically, the North Vietnamese used uh, used the U.S. withdrawal um, and the uh, the ceasefire to build up, uh, rather than withdraw their forces from uh, South Vietnam and Cambodia. So basically kind of in the northern sections, the jungles of uh, South Vietnam um, and in Cambodia, basically the north used, uh, used the ceasefire as an opportunity to build up their forces. Um, they continued to receive uh, war material from both uh, China and Russia uh, in their effort to build up their forces. President Nixon had made a promise uh, that uh, we would use air power or set up logistical support to South Vietnam uh, if there were any violations to the peace treaty. However, um, that would never be enforced because after Nixon uh, left office, um, then President Gerald R. Ford was not able to enforce the Nixon Doctrine uh, because Congress had passed the War Powers Resolution Act of October 1973. Um, basically, this uh, War Powers Resolution Act of 1973, um, still basically in effect today, what this did was limited the president's power to wage war. So in essence, the president can only wage war for a certain number of days uh, without getting congressional approval uh, to, uh, to extend that war uh, or uh, to dedicate basically this kind of power to the first Congress pulls the money. They can limit a war basically by uh, limiting the budget. So in February 1975, the North launched its uh, largest, most massive conventional offensive of the war. They called it the Ho Chi Minh Campaign, named after uh, the former leader Ho Chi Minh. South Vietnam had large forces, however, they were dispersed uh, to deal with guerrillas that were not prepared uh, to counter a major conventional offensive. So. Again, this was a kind of conventional offensive. There were tanks rolling through the streets of uh, South Vietnamese cities. Um, and they lacked the economic or political strength to survive. Um, they didn't have a strong government at the time. Uh, very kind of controversial government uh, running South Vietnam. Um, and many South Vietnamese troops kind of just dropped their weapons and kind of abandoned their posts uh, during this offensive. South Vietnam surrendered on 30 April 1975, um, and that was basically the day after the last uh, U.S. helicopters left the embassy with, uh, with U.S. troops, uh, the last remaining U.S. troops, uh, as well as many South Vietnamese civilians uh, who had been kind of sympathetic to the United States. Uh, so in essence, we never, we never launched that massive aerial campaign again. Um, to uh, kind of force this final offensive. Uh, the United States kind of grown weary of war. Uh, we we're not going to commit troops anymore. Yes? What was the act called again? By the uh, war Powers, just want to make sure, Resolution Act. And is it of 1975? Of 1973. Okay. Yep. Okay, so we're going to kind of, we saw pretty much the last uh, 10 minutes or so of that video, we kind of saw uh, air power in action. We're going to kind of talk a little bit about how uh, U.S. role kind of changed throughout the war uh, as far as air power went, um, as well as uh, some more specifics uh, about those missions. So, uh, war in Southeast Asia was primarily a land-based war. Uh, again, our primary focus during the war was uh, fighting uh, the Viet Cong, so those were the, the guerrillas, the ununiformed. Uh, South Vietnamese communists. Um, so basically a lot of our air power efforts were just to kind of support those ground uh, operations. 
We were not concerned about air superiority uh, over South Vietnam. So basically we had freedom of the skies uh, when conducting operations in South Vietnam. Uh, North Vietnamese kept their MiGs, their fighter aircraft, north of the 17th parallel. So we did not have to worry about um, any attacks in the air uh, while flying in South Vietnam. Uh, and the Viet Cong being basically a guerrilla, uh, kind of a, a force of you know peasants and farmers, and um, they didn't have any combat aircraft of their own to, uh, to fight us in South Vietnam. You kind of see the in-country operations. Uh, those are just basically the um, in-country operations in South Vietnam. Uh, we obviously had some air-to-air -air combat um, and some air-to-ground combat in North Vietnam, but within the uh, in South Vietnam, those were the missions we flew. Uh, as in Korea. Uh, as well as in the early days of World War II, there were some problems uh, with the command of air power uh, in Vietnam. Most of our operations were tied to supporting ground operations, so uh, ground commanders kind of were seeking to kind of have control over those operations again. The Air Force, of course, though, having learned its lessons in North Africa and World War II, resisted uh, that proposal. And kind of all along the way, too, uh, the Navy asserted its own independence by refusing to place its air units um, under a central command. So basically, they wanted to run their own air operations. The Army wanted to have control over all the air operations uh, as well. And the Air Force said, no, we should have control. Uh, in general, we got along fine. Um, but again, kind of that, uh, that lack of a, a unified command for, uh, for air uh, was uh, somewhat detrimental. So we'll talk about this more in coming weeks, but basically as a result of kind of those disagreements, um, we kind of restructured our way uh, in the 1970s, 1980s uh, in the way we ran a war. So basically there would either be a three or four star general uh, in charge of an entire uh, area of operations, um, and beneath that general would be um, a number two or three star general who was responsible for the ground war, um, for, the, for the naval war, uh, and for the air war. Um, and that air, what we call them as an air component commander, um, is the same way we do it nowadays, is typically it's a two or three star general, and all air assets are kind of placed under them. So there's kind of no bickering uh, kind of between the services. Is that the current? Is that the current system? Yeah, that's how we kind of do it nowadays. So For the um, Air Force? Or? Yep. So kind of uh, what they did kind of when we were really kind of heavily embroiled in uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom, there was a three-star general uh, in charge of it. Um, so it, for, for those who uh, have there was like a numbered Air Force commander. They basically kind of dual had it as that uh, air component commander. Would that be like one general in command of air components for the Air Force and like the Navy? Yeah. Okay. So they would have all, basically all the services. Uh, the only one that kind of is kind of gray area sometimes is like the uh, Army units, their helicopters, because again, they're kind of more directly supporting. Um, so, kind of some weirdness with that. Um, but yeah, basically, they kind of run the air war. And I mean, they can obviously delegate a lot of that out. They can say, hey, you know, one star general over here, you know, you're in charge of this area of operations. That's basically what they did um, for Iraq and Afghanistan. So, there was a three star in charge of kind of the whole area of operations, but obviously. One guy or gal is not making all those decisions. They've got to kind of delegate some of that out. Wait, didn't you also say there was a four-star general? Yeah, and they're kind of overseeing the whole the whole area of operations. So they're kind of over over the guy or gal running the air war, uh, the person running kind of naval operations and the ground war. So the next in line is the commander in chief. Or? Basically, yeah. From there, um, it's they're called combatant commanders. Okay. So they're kind of running the whole operation. And they report basically to. Uh, to the president, but also kind of the Secretary of Defense. Secretary of Defense is kind of more administrative uh, in that regard. So. And is he a five star? No. So uh, we haven't done five stars since World War II. Um, so uh, Secretary of Defense is just, uh, yeah, just a civilian dude. Or maybe that. 
could happen. So kind of uh, looking uh, at the years of major U.S. involvement uh, in the war, again, we kind of had a pretty quick buildup uh, during, uh, during the early years uh, of the war after the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. We set up uh, 10 major air bases uh, in South Vietnam. Uh, in addition to these, we had uh, we had bases basically all over the Pacific. Uh, we had a uh, base in Guam. We had bases in uh, Thailand, which were not far away either, uh, as well as several bases in Japan that we could support operations in Vietnam from. Kind of, uh, we kind of talk about 1964 to 1968. That's kind of the uh, the buildup phase. Remember, 1968, 1969 was kind of when we transformed our role from kind of major combat operations to Vietnamization. So during 1964 to 68, during that buildup phase, we were basically our main uh, roles were to uh, stall um, suspected enemy offensives. Again, in our effort to uh, support ground troops as well, uh, we're going to defend and supply isolated outposts. So, you know, again, kind of being a uh, you know uh, mountainous uh, jungle kind of terrain uh, throughout Vietnam, uh, roads were not always reliable ways to uh, to bring supplies uh, in. So, um, we all set up. The Army had a lot of uh, what's called fire bases, kind of set up small outposts. Uh, where basically they were trying to draw the Vietnamese out of the jungle to fight at these outposts. Um, but they were all very, very remote. Um, so again, we, we were kind of often the, uh, the lifeline to keep them uh, thriving. And also during this time, we'll talk about it more next week when we talk Rolling Thunder, we were there to interdict uh, basically the southern end of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the South Vietnamese side. That was kind of during the uh, the buildup phase. Again, just kind of stopping the enemy in its tracks, uh, cutting off their logistical uh, supply lines, uh, and uh, supporting and defending uh, American outposts. During the Vietnamese uh, Vietnamization phase, um, we kind of turned into kind of more of a, uh, a backseat role to the South Vietnamese military during this time. So, so throughout the war, we have been training. Uh, the South Vietnamese Air Force, <clears throat> but we really kind of stepped up these efforts during the uh, Vietnamization phase. During this time, uh, as U.S. ground troops kind of were slowly pulling out of South Vietnam, we kind of turned uh, our role as the Air Force to supporting the South Vietnamese Army on the ground. And all the while, we were also trying to protect American units that were withdrawing at this time. So kind of as the Vietnamese phase was going on, um, we kind of kept handing more and more of these missions over to uh, uh, South Vietnamese Air Force. So by uh, the end of 1971, uh, the Vietnamese Air Force was responsible for about 70% of its uh, in-country combat operations. So of all the combat operations going on in southern Vietnam uh, for air uh, air operations, um, they were taking care of 70% of it, where previously that had been about 0%, kind of around that. Uh, and even uh, during linebacker one, 1972 spring, when we, uh, <clears throat> when we came into uh, Came brought many troops back in to counter the spring uh, Easter offensive by the north. Remember the 120,000 troops flooding south of the 17th parallel. Uh, after we had kind of uh, taken care of that offensive, we actually even withdrew many of our uh, our uh, squadrons that had deployed in support of that. And by the end of 1972. Um, the uh, Vietnamese Air Force, South Vietnamese Air Force, was the fourth largest air force in the world. So we had built them up 
and he's kind of talking a third world country uh, that we had built up to this massive military power. Kind of give a comparison, kind of more sort of modern day. Um, 1980s, Iraq and Iran were at war, uh, pretty bloody war for about eight or ten years. Um, we were kind of supporting Iraq at the time, and we basically turned them into, I think it was like the third largest military uh, in the world. So uh, our support can go a long way. So we're going to kind of move into uh, specific missions we flew. So as you all know by now, interdiction. Um, Again, it's kind of cutting off supply lines. So this was a major in-country air mission uh, because we put great efforts into preventing supplies from reaching communist forces uh, in the south from North Vietnam. You kind of see a few of the aircraft um, up there. So again, any aircraft with an F in its name is what kind of aircraft? Fighter aircraft. So primarily, typically have an air-to-air -air mission, but they can also strap bombs, um, air-to-ground weapons on those aircraft as well. And then the uh, the AC-130 gunship. Remember, that's that uh, cargo aircraft outfitted with the cannon, uh, the mini guns, uh, all those awesome weapons. Uh, to kind of fly slow around a target, kind of orbiting uh, and putting weapons on target. Um, kind of the major uh, weapon that we used was the B-52 Stratofortress bomber. This bomber had been initially created uh, as a weapon of the Cold War to deliver nuclear weapons, um, but we had outfitted it basically the ability to carry conventional weapons. Uh, and with, uh, with its range, especially with air-to-air -air refueling, we were able to um, launch them from uh, Anderson Air Force Base in Guam. And they flew approximately 12 hour missions uh, from there. And just to give you a, uh, a sense of how many bombs a B 52 could carry, uh, it was roughly 50 tons of bombs or 108,000 pounds of conventional bombs. Uh, a full payload was roughly, I had a friend in high school who did a calculation of this based on the rate the bombs dropped and uh, the explosive power of the bombs. Um, basically, if it just dropped them all in one fail swoop, um, it would be approximately a, a half mile wide um, by about a mile and a quarter long, uh, just path of destruction. So, uh, pretty crazy. Um, and we sent up, you know, missions with... Uh, with dozens, some missions with hundreds of those um, kind of going. Can I ask you a question? Yep. Uh, what's with the uh, the, the nickname there? Does, For the aircraft? Yeah, does the, uh, does the uh, maker or the producer? Usually, yes, it's the, I think it's like the, the, um, the developer of the aircraft. The services might have some. But you Same. wouldn't actually call it like, you know, like Phantom uh, if you were to give an order or something. I mean, uh, in well, code. Well, they, they can. Um, usually, like on actual missions, though, they, they kind of have just like code names for them. So they'll use like uh, Cobra 1, this is Batman 2 or something. So <laughs> they, uh, but yeah, the, the, these are all kind of actually formal names. So like the F 100 up there that, that is known as the Super Saver. Um, so they all kind of are given uh, nicknames. I don't know. This is kind of, uh, I think, in the post World War II uh, or even World War II kind of era, like the uh, P 51 Mustang. Uh, they always kind of got nicknames. So, um, those of you going to Maxwell Air Force Base this summer, you're going to be able to see an F 4 Phantom, an F 100 Super Saver, and an F 105 Thunder Chief. So you can all be the, uh, the smartest people by saying, oh, I know what aircraft that is. So I'll take sure of it. Um, but again, being that one of our major uh, operations, uh, most of our operations surrounded around supporting ground troops, uh, close air support was another major uh, mission. So again, oftentimes uh, ground strategy was to pin down the enemy uh, and call in for air support to take out the enemy. 
you see a whole bunch of different aircraft up there. Um, the A designation in aircraft, um, that strictly means those are attack aircraft. Uh, primarily their whole role in the Air Force is close air support. So kind of in modern days, anybody think of an A attack aircraft? Okay, very good. So the A-10, um, it's an aircraft we're using now heavily uh, fighting ISIS um, in Iraq. But again, we kind of were using other aircraft, uh, fighter aircraft, so the uh, F-4 Phantom, the F-100 uh, Super Sabre, um, as well as the, uh, the AC-47 uh, gunship. Again, AC-47, that's a converted cargo aircraft, the C-47s. So everybody remember from last semester what C-47 was famous for? Do you little rain? Nope. Yep, Berlin Airlift. So again, uh, 1947, 1948, C-47s are delivering milk and cereal, hungry kids in Berlin. And now what are they delivering? Bombs, bullets, <laughs> you name it. So these gunships have the ability to orbit basically in left-handed circles uh, with the gun and cannon. Uh, mounted on left side for hours in the battle areas uh, supporting uh, <coughs> troops. Since the thick jungles made it impossible for pilots of our fast jets to often see many of our ground targets, a uh, use of those fast jets for accurate close air support uh, would have been impossible had it not been for forward air controllers. So forward air controllers, remember seeing those kind of slow moving Cessnas flying around the jungles in the video? Um, that was their job. They were helping spot the enemy, mark the enemy, either with flares or smoke, um, or faster moving aircraft. And they they actually have one of those Cessna aircraft at Maxwell too, one of the dorms. So, so if anybody ever says, "What is that Cessna doing there?" You can say, "I bet a Ford air controller would do it in the Vietnam War." Uh, close air support, though, um, in conjunction with tactical airlift, so bringing supplies in to uh, outposts, to uh, Marines and uh, Army troops on the ground, um, saved many of those outposts, um, as well as uh, helped defeated uh, the Viet Cong during the Tet Offensives, Tet Offensive and the Easter uh, Offensive. Right, and that's a good spot to stop today since we're out of time. Uh, next week we'll finish talking about uh, reconnaissance, search and rescue, the uh, air to air refueling mission, and then we're going to dig a lot more into rolling thunder, linebacker one. And if that's near, we're going to, we should have more information by the end of the week about the PSP, POC selection process. So. We'll, uh, we'll get information out to you. Uh, but again, it's probably going to be pretty similar to last year as far as the categories all that kind of stuff. But I will be coming uh, probably next week. We'll have you all come in, talk uh, if you want to go rated, not rated, um, and just make sure we got the uh, correct uh, major, day of graduation, all that good stuff. Um, so can there be um, 